I'd like to call the meeting to order, and I'd like to start off by saying that the council has just met in closed session, and we have nothing to report, but there will be items regarding the number, item number four, item number three, the uh, hacienda that, that we'll be talking more about. So at this point, yes. And just to clarify, we met in closed session regarding existing lit litigation, Hacienda Realty, LLC, and Russell Stanley versus City of Montecerino. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, can we please stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Can we have a roll call, please? Sure. Council Member Ann Standig? Here. Council Member Rogers? Here. Council Member Turner? Here. Council Member Wolsheimer? Here. And Mayor Craig? Here. Thank you. Okay. So thank you all very much for attending tonight. Uh, at this time, I'd like to see if there's any changes to the orders of the day. There are none. Okay, seeing none, I would like to move to oral communications at this point. Anybody who would like to speak on any item that is not on the agenda. Uh, I don't have any speaker cards that say open communication, um, but I do have one from Ruth Nelson, who said she had a couple of, uh, I'm sorry, it says Blanchard on the top. Yeah. That goes in a Blanchard pile. Well, sure. Please come up, and uh, if you could please let us know your name, and I'll, I'll pull your card out of here. Hi. My name Hi. is Ruth Nelson, and I'm Vineland oh, Avenue. this is you. And I just, it's not a question I, per se. When Sacramento makes these um, rules that you have to have X amount of people or X amount of homes in our areas, why does Sacramento get to just take a rubber stamp and Montecerino is, such, Montecerino is such a unique area. Why? It's almost like Russia, Sacramento, telling us what we have to do. And we're, we're going to have very contentious speaking tonight with the, with the church property in La Hacienda and everything. But if government, I understand government, trust me. And I know you, it's so hard to fight. You can't. But why do they have to have the privilege of saying what the rest of the whole state of California has to do. Somebody in a council meeting has said, you know something, I think it'd be great if we would put in that this senior housing or low income housing or whatever, but Montessorino only has so many, so much space, so many utilities. You can't just put all of us in like a can of worms. Pretty soon we're all fighting and it's just, they're ruining our way of life, and I'm well aware of what you guys are going through, but why couldn't somebody just stand up and say, you know something, it's not working for us. Maybe we need to do something else, and is there something, a way that we could do it that would make sense? Because we've all worked like crazy to have what we have in this area, and a lot of us are all retired, and now you're going to change our way of life per se. I mean, just look at Winchester and the traffic and Netflix and give us a break, you know? So I only had that to say. I know you guys have rules and regulations, but somebody in Sacramento had to say, you know something, let's do it, and we'll make everybody follow us. Why can't somebody fight them? Period. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hard to see. Okay, uh, at this point, I would like to see if anybody would like to pull any items from the consent calendar. Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you very much. Okay, so we don't have any public hearings to discuss tonight. And item number three is the Blanchard Drive Pilot Project Status Report. 
And Jim, I have a feeling you're going to take the lead on this. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Of course, the the, oh, over, the projector, <laughs> it, it cooled down while we were waiting, but coming up now. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, tonight, uh, myself and Julie Bazad will be giving you a brief uh, presentation about the Blanchard Drive Pilot Improvement Project. <clears throat> Much apologies. Um, so um, the council is well aware of the pilot uh, improvement project under consideration on Blanchard. Several Blanchard Drive residents and property owners are here tonight. This began back in February of 2017 when Blanchard Drive residents approached the city on the concept of moving forward with a pilot project to not only repave their street but to install curbs and gutters as well. Many actions have occurred all year, which you're well aware of. Uh, but on November 30th, we had a well-attended community meeting here with over uh, 14 of the property owners of the 27 property owners were present. We had a very good discussion about this conceptual plan that is on the wall behind you. And that led into a December 19th city council meeting where after uh, another excellent meeting with a lot of uh, good feedback to staff, you directed us to uh, take, take some key actions. And what you directed staff to do was to proceed with the pilot improvement project, perform further investigation on assessment district formations, and investigate other funding options um, for this project, uh, including a vehicle refuse impact fee and general fund transfers. And as you know, we did discuss vehicle refuse impact fees at last month's, or two weeks ago at the council meeting and the item was tabled. So now I'd like to turn it over to Julie, uh, who will talk a little bit more about the Assessment District Act process. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Craig, members of the council audience. Uh, my name is Julie Bessot, and I will be going through the next few slides, which talks about assessment district and what's involved with forming an assessment district. And uh, before I start, I would like to int introduce Dennis Klink Klinkelhofer. He's sitting in the back. He's with Harrison Associate, who helped us to do that further investigation on forming an assessment district. Yeah. So if there is any question that any of our staff would not be able to answer, uh, Dennis will be helping us to answer those questions. With that, I'll move on to the first slide. Uh, there are two types of uh, assessment district uh, that were considered for this project. One of them was the 1982 Act, and then the other one was 1913. And with this, on this slide, we are going over the steps that it takes to form a 1982 Act Assessment District, which is very similar to 1913, with the only difference is the 1982, the term for the assessment part of it is only five years, not to exceed five years. In 1913, uh, you could assess the uh, assess value for more than five years. And the very first uh, uh, box that you see here, this is where the process get initiated. That's where we are here tonight. This is the very first meeting that once we get the direction to initiate the, pro, you know, the uh, assessment district, we will proceed. And the next uh, most important document, one of the most important document is the engineer's report that in between the initiation and the engineer's report, we need to have the design semi-complete to have the information to help us to uh, finalize the engineer's report, which basically uh, at the engineer's report, the decision is being made based on the data that how much each property owner is benefiting 
from the improvements that are going to be installed and how much their assessed value is. And uh, moving on after that, uh, there's a resolution of intention needs to be adopted by the council. Uh, the, at that point, we set a public hearing. We send out notices and ballot to all the property owners. And uh, at the end, when we have the public hearing, if uh, we have the majority of ballots that are against the, pro uh, the formation of the assessment district, it won't move forward. But if we have majority of ballots are not against the project, and then the, uh, assess the assessment district will be formed. The next slide, basically, I won't go through all the steps since I've already covered most of the steps uh, in the previous slide. It gives you an idea of what the schedule is to form an assessment district. And from the initial meeting until to the point that we have the public hearing, mm -hmm. it approximately takes about 14 weeks to form an assessment district. Uh, that's like the best case scenario. Moving on to the next slide, as Jim mentioned, we did have a public meeting where we had the uh, property owners on Blanchard attended the meeting in, on November 30th, where we shared these slides with them. This slides talks about the improvements that are gonna be installed over on Blanchard. We are considering three different treatments being proposed for the frontage improvements. These are based on our standard details. There are rolled curbs and gutter, valley gutter, and asphalt berm. And the, these are the uh, summary of the cost. And the unit costs, uh, we have been contacting other public agencies where they had a project that he went out to bid. And these are an estimate, a representation of the unit cost that they have received. And we use an example of a property that is approximately 100 feet as far as the frontage. So we're looking at for properties that are gonna have rolled curb and gutter with 100 feet of frontage, they're looking at about $4,500. Uh, and that's the same dollar amount for the properties that they're gonna get valley gutter, gonna have valley gutter installed in front of their property. We're looking at $4,500. The asphalt, asphalt berm is uh, cheaper than the other two treatment and for a 140 feet frontage, we're looking at about $2,100. Again, these numbers are very rough estimates that we received back in November, and uh, after we have the bid opening, these numbers may change. The next slides basically give you more details. There are a total of 24 properties on Blanchard that do not have their frontage improvements. And out of the 24, there are 14 of them that we are proposing that they would get the rolled uh, curb and gutter. And I think Jim already mentioned the exhibit that we have behind you that talks about which property gets what type of a treatment. And there are eight properties that are proposed to have valley gutter installed. And there are two properties that are being proposed to have asphalt berm. And with the unit cost that we covered in the previous slide, and they're roughly their frontage, we're looking at about $106,000 and $650 for the total of assessed value that we have for these properties. The next style, uh, <clears throat> sorry, slide, uh, it goes over the costs that we have gone through so far are the hard costs to install these treatments in front of uh, property uh, properties that we have on Blanchard. But in addition to these costs, we have what we call the soft costs to get this project moving, form the assessment district if we choose to go that option, and have the design completed. So looking at the table in front of you, or uh, we have, in order to have a bid package to go out to bid, we're looking at about estimate of $45,000 to do the design additional inspection of 5,000. We're looking at uh, uh, $17,000 for an engineer's report and including some contingency. So the total additional cost that the city has to pay in addition to what this will be assessed is around $83,000 to complete this project and placing it, advertising it to go out to bid. Uh, based on what we talked about and what's stated in the staff report, there are three options being introduced here. The first option is that if the city, if we would 
move forward with forming the assessment district. The total cost, of course, it's going to be about $263,000, and that's after property assessment are paid back to the city. That would be the net result cost to the city if we move forward with the assessment district. The second option is that we could always go back and look at what the PMP has uh, proposed, and that would be just repaving the travel lane and not to install any frontage improvements in front of any of the properties. <coughs> and for that uh, option, we have budgeted about $180,000 to overlay just the travel lane. And the third option is if the ch city chooses to fund the entire project, including installation on all the frontage improvement, we are looking at uh, approximately about $370,000. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jim and kick over the others. Thanks, Julia. I think it's really important as we discuss these options and these approximate estimates, approximate numbers that we're using as estimates that we t look broader into the Bay Area and the bidding climate that we're facing. Um, there is tremendous amount of new funds that are available to local cities and counties and well as Caltrans um, due to the passage of Measure B, our local sales tax, and through Senate Bill 1 passage, which raised everybody's gas tax effective last November 1st. Um, with all of this new uh, money being available, we're, we are seeing and witnessing firsthand a tremendous amount of competition mm -hmm and that limits the number of available paving contractors that um, uh, could bid on a project of this nature. Uh, it's also true that uh, the larger projects uh, are a higher priority for, for their contractors. They can bid on one large project, lock it up for months and months, and it, it does put pressure on the smaller projects like a one-block uh, paving project. Um, so obviously then advertising for projects, uh, paving or concrete work earlier in the year is more advantageous to our city that, and the com bidding will be more competitive. But as Julie was sharing with me today and as I'm seeing and as many of you see, with the weather that we're having right now, there's paving going on, concrete work going on, housing construction. Uh, there has not been a let up. So we're under, we're under a lot of um, winter time work that we don't normally see when bids come in lower. Uh, so because of this, we're, we're alerting you right now that actual bid prices could come in maybe 25% or higher due to the conditions that we're in. We just have to wait and see what they really are, but we've given it our best estimate. So in conclusion, I think the Blanchard Drive Pilot Improvement Project has really been a, a very a good collaborative process for the last 12 months ever since that first February uh, meeting. Um, the property owners have shown a very strong uh, interest to even tax themselves for their curb and gutter improvements. It's that important that they see uh, their street be uh, dealt with on a, on, a, on a quality basis. Also installing frontage, curb, gutter, and drainage improvements at the time of repaving uh, would maximize the life of the pavement. As we've seen on our streets and as we even heard two weeks ago, paving streets without uh, the rigidity of concrete and curbs, gutters, uh, will often result in a, a life expectancy of the project that's not uh, as good as it could have otherwise been. Bidding climate's a major concern. And because of all of these points, our conclusion to you before we submit our recommendation is that our preferable course of action from staff uh, is to have the city fund the entire project uh, at an overall savings uh, in comparison to if we had to reconstruct the project in 21-22, which is in the pavement management program report. Uh, in your staff report, and just to let <coughs> others know that haven't seen that staff report, it's estimated that it would cost over about $550,000 if we wait to the fifth year as was proposed in the pavement management report. So by moving now in this fiscal year and including the curbs and gutters, uh, we're looking at a, a cost much less than that. So our recommendation to you tonight is that you direct this staff to seek competitive bids for the design. 
uh, which takes us from conceptual to final, uh, that uh, we proceed with one of the following options, uh, either of the 82 or 1913 Assessment District Act, or pave the travel lanes only, or have the city fund the entire project. And our third recommendation is that this whole topic of pavement management program, funding options, frontage improvements, that we introduce that to our newly formed Better Streets Commission. Uh, and I understand that the first meeting uh, for orientation has been set. And uh, the goal would be to come back during the budget proceedings um, before you adopt next year's budget to have further direction to you as to what staff is recommending for the, the broader payment management program. With that, I will bring it to a close. I'll just leave those recommendations on the screen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, any other comments from staff? Okay. And I would like to see if any members would like to ask staff any questions. Yes, Council Member Turner. Yes, um, at our last meeting, we talked about a policy that was put in place years ago where our general reserve funds is approximately twice that of the city's annual operating budget. Hence, we have a $3 million operating budget and our reserve fund of $6 million. So my question is, what would it take procedurally and legally to revise this percentage down? Well, the, the, this is currently a part of the, uh, the city council's fiscal policy, um, so I, it would just it would be a matter of, of making a revision to that and approving it. And um, this will certainly be a, a topic of discussion at the budget uh, when we start working on the budget. Um, I, as I noted to all of you, this is something I definitely you know think that we should be talking about because it uh, it would involve. Um, you know, if that would be changed, it would it would free up some money that could ultimately be used for the pavement management program and other similar streets like Blanchard. Um, so yes, that that's what it would require. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, how do we get Rogers. some of that extra sales tax money, so we can do it like these other cities are all grabbing the extra money from the gas tax and such? Uh, it's all formula based the Senate bill measure as well as the local sales tax. They have a local streets and roads component It's all formula based on population So I'm Do we get any of that money. Oh, yes. Yes, okay. we've we've uh, indicated in past meetings the the numbers are up significantly uh, That's what's driving so much uh, Work in other cities as well as our desire to do more work as well but we are getting our share. Oh, okay. And one more. Yes, question. Council Member. I understand it. Thank you. If I understand it correctly, this particular assessment district would be this street only, Blanchard Drive. And if in the future we would attack different uh, streets, we would create more than one assessment district, possibly dozens of assessment districts. How, how practical is that for a small city like Montesarino? Uh, well, uh, we're we're finding it's not too practical to look at assessment districts one street at a time. You, I think generally they are used for uh, broader improvement projects in zones, geographical areas, uh, or a type of infrastructure that might be citywide that all all the population would benefit from. So your direction to us has been to look at it individually on this street as well as in the future to look at it as a possible mechanism in the future. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So, Jim, uh, if you could just clarify. So, the your really option number three on tonight's recommendations, that would be uh, that issue about creating uh, future assessment districts would go before the um, the new commission, the Better Streets Commission that we created. Uh, Regardless of what we do for A, B, and C? Yes. Yes. Uh, we think the new Better Streets Commission is an excellent uh, uh, avenue to, to have it um, vetted out publicly. And not only just the um, potential of forming assessment districts, but to take a look at the general fund balance uh, to take a look at existing franchise fees that we collect, uh, re-examine our numbers that the county and the state are giving us, 
and and look look at all potential funding sources so we can do a more robust uh, payment management program than than what we discussed last year. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I had one quick question. Uh, do we have any assessment districts in the city already? We do. We have two. Uh, we have the Rose Andrews Lighting District and the. Is that the only one? We have one. Sorry. Okay. And we do bring it to you um, for a public meeting and a public hearing, typically in June or July. Correct. So, and that's um, it involves a, an engineer's report. The the um, council for the assessment district reviews it and then brings it forward to the to the council. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. At this time, I'd like to open it up for public comment, and I have a few speaker cards. I'd like to start off with Lynn Perham. Good evening, one and all. So I don't know where Blanchard is. I assume it's somewhere around Monasterino. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I have something to say about this project. I'm in favor of it. I was here a week or so or a month ago or something to talk about uh, the, the uh, shortfall in the quality of the paved streets in Monasterino and the fact we haven't been paying attention to our infrastructure. So I think that uh, my recommendation and opinions are that we should uh, modify the policy to be able to access our balance sheet on a one-time basis to uh, to take care of this project. Uh, it, additionally, I think we should uh, work as a team here to develop a policy for putting curbs everywhere in our town. The, the place is uh, extraordinarily nice to live. And you guys made a very convincing point that you don't get good life out of pavement that's not sealed on the edges so water gets under it and breaks it. I don't know which one of those three ways of doing curbing and guttering is the most reliable and which one is most appropriate. But in effect, uh, in fact, I, I think that we should uh, modify the, the, ba the balance sheet policies to allow to access it. I think we should curb this. I don't care if we try to assess the owners or if we do it ourselves because you guys showed me that the difference is a lifetime of five, six, seven, eight years versus maybe 20 years. Um, that done, I think uh, looking forward, uh, you know, I think we have a $2 million shortfall in, uh, in infrastructure problems, i.e. pavement around our town. I think it was two or three miles. I think we should access our balance sheet to take care of that $2 million project as well. Maybe we say we don't draw down more than 50% of our balance sheet, but we get this done once and for all. I also suggested at the meeting, maybe if we can get a loan at, at uh, very low interest rates in a rising interest rate economy, we can borrow money at favorable rates and rates go up later and it helps pay for the cost of the money and so on. And I think we ought to also have a policy in the town that everything we're going to do here now is going to be curbed so that we get maximum life and beauty in our town. So those are my opinions. Blanchard should go forward and we should change these policies and uh, upgrade the, the uh, quality of our pavement and, of course, develop plans to maintain it properly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Diadio. Mayor, Council, I am a Blanchard resident and I've been involved with, with this process for the past year. Um, as you all know, right, as you can see from these numbers, the efficiencies of the uh, assessment district are not quite there. But that said, uh, as a Blanchard resident, our objective is to get our street paved as quickly as possible because we believe it's a safety item. So, you know, we'll support, you know, whatever the, I speak for myself, but I'm sure other Blanchard neighbors will say, we support the council in whatever you decide to do. Uh, you know, if you think that the assessment district is the way we have to go and it can be accomplished, and it, that is an if, um, you know, even though we had 14 residents say they'd support it out of 27, um, you know, it, it's still the best way for us to go. We need the right streets. We need them so that they're secure, paved, and will last for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Felipe Alves. I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name, Philippa. Philippa. <laughs> sorry That's about okay. that. That's okay. Everybody does. I answer to almost anything that sounds like <laughs> Philippa. <laughs> and I am Philippa Alvis, and of course, I live on Blanchard. Um, 
We are very pleased and want to express our gratitude for the support that this council has given to our request to have the street repaired because as everyone agrees and knows, it's a mess. Um, we do, Mike just said we want to get it paved as quickly as we can. That's true, but we would like to encourage you to consider the curb and as well as the center for all the reasons that have been stated exactly. We'd rather have it paved well than hurried. We would also like to encourage, and we know financing is a part of this, and you already know that we're willing to accept the costs of the curb because in the long run it's much cheaper for the council to contract the entire street than for us to try to individually do curbings. We would like to encourage you to look at the policy that has tied your hands. That policy for the amount of money that is held in reserve is not your fault. That was handed down to you by a prior council. And it's only a policy, it's not a law, and it can be revisited. We would encourage you very much to revisit this policy and adjust the percentage of income, city income, downward so it's more in line with other surrounding municipalities. And that will, we we're sure, free up quite a bit of money that will help with projects in our city. Thanks. Thank you very much. Michael Treese. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to speak. And uh, I want to applaud the work that's been done on behalf of the city and the PMP report. I read it. <clears throat> it's only 87 pages long, has quite a bit of detail, some great maps, um, quite a bit of information in there. So um, it answered a number of questions I raised at the last city council meeting. In looking at the Blanchard proposal, um, I think this is one of the things in terms of one of the streets that needs to be addressed and fixed as soon as possible. I think I agree with that proposal. My questions really have to do with the formation um, of these assessment districts. How large a district can you form? Does it have to be 20 houses? Could it be two houses? Could you simply say, your house is in one assessment district and not another. I know that's kind of absurd, but the question is, when you start forming these districts, you're now assessing homeowners differently in each street or each area of the city. And that seems kind of contradictory to having a city that is uniform and is a community and kind of works together. So I really do oppose forming separate assessment districts. I would pr prefer that the city fund entirely all the improvements as stated, having the curbs and all of that work done is better, um, will last longer, and will give us a much better environment um, for Blanchard and other streets going forward. In particular, I was pleased in the report to see that the drainage was included. That was one of my concerns last time, that you are looking at drainage. Um, there's a lot of other things that go into it that I won't go into details now, but we'll, you know, in terms of determining the life of a particular street, like underground utility work and other things that need to go into that. Um, just to reiterate, I think the formation of districts on a one-time basis, let's just form it for Blanchard right now, is premature that a citywide plan, if you're going to form districts, should be an entire citywide plan and not just something that we put together for one street. And again, how large are these districts? Are they one home, 20 homes, 1,000 homes? Well, can't be more than 1,000 because I don't think we have more than about 1,500 homes here in the city. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Bobby Greenberg. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I live on the corner of uh, Vineland and Cavan Lane. Uh, about uh, two, three weeks ago, our street was actually uh, acknowledged by him as being one of the better streets in design and the way that it's held up. Our street has uh, curbs, 
our street has uh, doesn't have any paving problems, and we have garbage trucks coming down every week, um, and it's held up very well. I do live one block from Blanchard, and I walk the street often. Um, it's in bad need of repair, and everybody's done it, so I thank the council for doing this and uh, willing to do it. Uh, I'm, I rise to in support of what everybody else has said. I do think uh, that you need to revisit your policy uh, as far as to what should remain in the general fund. I also understand that about, was it 17 or 19 percent? of what the four cities get back from waste management as you proposed before. You don't allocate to the streets, but you put it into the general fund. Uh, and maybe you want to consider that as an option as well. I'd love to see uh, curbs put on it as proposed. I don't know that the homeowners need to do this if you're going to do a general plan for the entire city. Um, but I do think there's some reserve, there's some time. And everything is not going to be done in one year. As you said, this is a, a multi-year project that should go on and on. So I rise in support of it and appreciate the effort. Thank you very much. And this is the last speaker card I have on this agenda item. If anybody else would like to speak on it, please uh, bring a speaker card up. Marsha Wire. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to council. And I would like to see if anybody has any questions or comments. Start from my left. Any questions? Okay. No questions? Yes. I have some comments. Okay, um, some comments. Um, I'm actually increasingly skeptical about multiple assessment districts. It, it doesn't seem to be very practical, and I think... A lot of people have uh, voiced the same opinion here. Um, I am in favor of uh, releasing additional funds from the from our general reserve to start this project off before we miss the the window, so to speak, to get the uh, the offers in. So, I, th I think I'd like to move as quickly as possible. And I also support the calls that people have put out for releasing or changing our policy. We currently have 200% in reserve. And I think we should consider changing that number downwards, uh, maybe uh, to 100 percent or even below 100 percent. The uh, revenue that the city receives is fairly stable, so uh, lowering that number doesn't appear to be very risky at all. Okay, thank you yeah. very much. All right, so council member? Uh, I'd like to make a motion. Okay, um, just one quick question before you did that, if I could. Um, so we have three items. Can we take each one individually, or do we have to take it all as a single um, motion? Because uh, number two has an A, B, or C part to it. So you could do it. The maker of the motion could make a motion to approve, for example, one, two, B, and three. Okay. And that would be appropriate. It, if it seems like everyone's leaning on the, on the same option on number two, that would be the um, easiest way to do it. Okay, thank you. All right, Council Member Anstanding. Uh, thank you. I uh, am, would like to make a motion that the City Council uh, direct the City Manager to seek competitive bids for the design of the Blanchard Drive pilot project uh, as presented in the conceptual improvement plan in the November <clears throat> 30, 2017 community meeting that we proceed uh, to fund the entire project, including curbs and gutters at the city's expense, and uh, thirdly, bring uh, the newly uh, formed Better Streets Commission uh, uh, and advise them to, or ask them to advise the city manager on long-term funding options for pavement maintenance and drainage. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not proposing anything with respect to our budgeting because it's not on the agenda. Uh, but just simply to get this project started, 
started 12 months ago, and I think it's time to get it finished and get it start get it started and then get it finished. So that's my motion. Okay. Thank you very much. Would anybody like to comment on the motion? I'm sorry. Um, yes. Okay. Would anybody like to second it? I'll I'll second it. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. And can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Council Member Rogers? Yes. Councilmember Wilsheimer? Yes. Councilmember Turner? Aye. Councilmember Ann Stantig? Yes. And Mayor Craig? Yes. Passes 5 0. And the motion passes. Thank and you. And I very just much. wanted to. Go. The only thing I would add is the exact amount of the cost and what additional transfers would be needed will come to you when we bring the contract to, to award the contract when we get that together and bring it to you. Okay. Okay, so item number four, consider processing and settlement agreement for La Hacienda and property. And uh, I think staff is going to have an introduction for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council members, before you this evening is a processing and settlement agreement with Hacienda Realty and Russell Stanley. And in the event that the City Council approves the settlement agreement, there is also a contract for, for, for professional services with EMC Planning Group for environmental review. Um, a bit of background, on October 16th, 2015, Hacienda Realty and Russell Stanley filed a lawsuit against the city challenging the city's 2015-2023 housing element. Uh, specifically, the Hacienda claims that the housing element does not comply with state law, and uh, they highlight program H-2.5. That program provides that the city council will consider a general plan amendment and rezoning for the First Baptist Church uh, to allow for up to 15 uh, dwelling units of multifamily housing in the public RM zoning district. The housing element continues to provide that in the event that is not concluded by December of 2016, the city will look for alternative sites. Uh, the city adopted the required general plan amendment for the First Baptist Church on May 17, 2016. Um, after that date, a referendum petition was circulated and it qualified to be placed on the ballot. It's currently scheduled to be on the ballot in November 2018. Hacienda has recently filed an amended complaint in the existing litigation to allege that the general plan amendment and rezoning for the First Baptist Church did not become effective by December 2016. Uh, therefore, the city has a mandatory duty under Government Code Section 65588 to immediately identify and take action to make available an alternative site. Hacienda Realty has approached the city to settle the case and to provide an alternative site under housing element program H-2.5. Uh, the terms of that agreement are outlined in the agreement before you tonight, but basically what it is is it's an agreement to process an application. Um, it is not an agreement to approve any particular project, but it outlines the, pro the process under which the city will submit that application to the city council for consideration. Uh, the agreement provides that the application will allow 36 units on the Hacienda site, 15 multifamily units, and 21 single-family homes. The application will include a general plan amendment and a pre-zoning for the Hacienda property to allow that density of development, and it will also provide a annexation, a tentative subdivision map, a planned development permit, and a grading use permit. Um, all would be necessary to develop the property in accordance with the site plan that's included in the settlement agreement. Uh, Hacienda would be required to submit complete applications by February 16th, 2018. If the application is not complete, the agreement may be terminated and the litigation will proceed. If this agreement is approved tonight, the existing litigation will be stayed pending the outcome of the decision on the application that will be submitted in February. Uh, the application will require compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. There was an environmental impact report previously prepared for that site uh, the, that was studied up to eight units per acre on the site. Um, that document will be used 
in the analysis, but additional environmental review is anticipated. The city did receive a proposal from EMC Planning Group to perform that work. Um, and as I mentioned, if you approve the processing agreement, we would recommend that you approve that contract. Under the contract, uh, the total contract price is $105,000. Under the terms of the settlement agreement, the city would pay a, up to $25,000 towards the general plan amendment and the pre-zoning, and Hacienda Realty and Russ Stanley would be responsible for the remainder. After only after staff and public review of the applications will the matter be brought forward for consideration. There will be a notice public hearing at which all property owners um, in the surrounding area and perhaps citywide will be notified of the hearing date. In addition, uh, the applicant has agreed to hold a community meeting um, prior to the public hearing to receive input from neighbors and other interested property owners. Um, but we do anticipate it, it will be brought to City Council for public review in June of 2018. The fiscal impact of this is the city will be responsible for up to $25,000 for the general plan amendment and the pre-zoning. Uh, these are two actions that the City Council has taken um, in the past, specifically that the city was responsible for the general plan amendment and the rezoning of the First Baptist Church. And the city council also, the city was responsible also for the general plan amendment and pre-zoning that previously occurred on the Hacienda site uh, to allow the density of, uh, currently allows three units per acre. Uh, Hacienda Realty and Russell Stanley will be responsible for all costs above $25,000, which includes environmental consultants, um, any subconsultants that are required, all application fees, and if approved, any building or development impact fees. In conclusion, staff recommends the approval of the processing and settlement agreement. As I mentioned, this is a processing agreement. We are not deciding the merits of the project this evening. You are merely agreeing to accept an application and process it through our normal planning procedures, which includes public input, public hearings, and as I mentioned, a community meeting as well. Um, the lawsuit will be stayed pending the entitlement process. At any time, Mr. Stanley can withdraw his application and the litigation can proceed subject to reimbursement to the city of any fees paid towards the environmental uh, review and the general plan and pre-zoning. Um, if the project is not approved, the litigation will resume at that time. Uh, there is no obligation for the city to approve the project. At the end of the public hearing process, if the council determines that the general plan amendment or any of the other entitlements are not appropriate on that site, based on all of the evidence presented to the council, you can vote to deny the project. Uh, you could also vote to condition the project, to reduce the density on the project. It's within the sole discretion of the city council at that time. If Hacienda Realty and Russell Stanley is not in agreement with any modifications to the plan, they do not have to accept the approvals and the litigation can proceed. Uh, so in conclusion, staff is recommending that you approve the processing agreement and that you approve the contract with EMC Planning Group. And I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for staff? Okay. No questions for staff. Okay, so at this time I'd like to open it up for public comment. We do have a number of cards that we're going to go through, so this will be sort of a, a little bit of a long process. And I just want to start off by saying, if, if history is any indicator, this is, this is going to be an, an emotional time for us all. And you know, we've done this a few times, so this, is, this isn't our, our, our first round on this. Um, but I would like to make sure that we stay focused on what the agenda item is about tonight and what we are going to be considering. We're only considering processing. We're only saying it's okay to submit a, a, an application in, in, in return for putting a stay on the existing litigation. So we're only agreeing to the process that the city and Hacienda Realty will follow for the potential development of the Hacienda property. We are not gonna be considering the development project at this time. We don't have an application. We don't have anything other than the pictures that you saw in our staff report about what this project would even look like. And so this is not going to be the time to consider the merit of any potential 
um, development. So a lot of times we'll address questions afterwards, but if, if questions are going to be posed regarding the development, we're not going to be able to answer them because we don't know anything about what the final project is going to look like. The City Council will only consider the merits of the proposal after the staff review of the applications, the compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, and public input. So there will be a, another time that we can actually discuss the merits of the, of the, of the project. Only after the council considers all of the evidence presented, the council will make a, de a decision. At the public hearing, the city council will hear all of the arguments for and against the project and will make a decision. The city council can decide to accept or deny or modify the application. It is not required by this processing and settlement agreement to approve anything tonight. So with that, I would like to invite our first speaker up, John Green. Good evening, my name is John Green, resident of Monte Sereno. Uh, I've been in here multiple times, as you've mentioned, for this issue. Um, I really want to express my strong support uh, for the council to accept the Hacienda application. Uh, the reason why is because this is now giving us an opportunity to have an alternative plan, uh, whereas before we only had one plan uh, to go forward with the state law that we have, uh, and that was to propose the uh, uh, the building of the Baptist Church project. Um, I think that this is going to help uh, get people to understand the um, alternative uh, issues, and this might get uh, the ability for people to understand the requirement that uh, the city of Monterey Sereno has. From what I understand, it is not just for the building, or I'm sorry, not just for the zoning of a project, but it's actually for bu building something for uh, multifamily homes. So. Uh, that is something that uh, was thought to be something that we, we could sweep under the rug by approving the uh, Baptist Church project. Uh, in contrast, I believe that um, if everybody is, has an ability to look at the opposing uh, uh, build, uh, then they can look at the relevance of the state law. Um, the other issue about uh, supporting the Hacienda application is that, um, again, this helps to give a voice to uh, uh, the Baptist Church, and specifically Mr. <coughs> McCarty, who has emphatically said multiple times in the past uh, that the church project is not wanted, and he is not wanting to have that. So um, if we have an alternative uh, project to look at, certainly the, the citizens of Montessoreno can uh, look at both things and, and weigh their opinion, uh, which I would promote. Um, I think that uh, having an application and going down the process of uh, looking at the different proposal would be extremely beneficial uh, because ultimately uh, this would come down to a vote of the residents of Montessoreno. Uh, we did get the uh, petition signed from about 500 people, 500 community members, um, saying that the church property is not a good solution for the requirement that we have for Monte Sereno. Um, I think that uh, allowing the Hacienda application to go through ultimately gives us the other choice, uh, and it gives all the citizens of Monte Sereno, uh another ability to vote and to consider, all of the, uh, to consider all of the issues and to be objective in their decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Philippa Alves, did it right? Second time around, very yeah. good. <laughs> First time, shame on me. Right. I'm still Philippa Alves. All right. <laughs> and I'm Devon Blanchard. I want to compliment this council for at last being open-minded enough and brave enough to consider this application, this request for uh, an application from the owner of the Hacienda pro uh, property. I urge you to accept and to continue the conversation that you have already started. It's only fair that we give an, you an opportunity and that you give the community an opportunity to learn more about 
the pluses and minuses of both sites. Of course, in our site, we consider the larger property to be more viable, to be more safe, to be better suited to the development of multiple housing. Uh, although it may sound like very uh, great density, uh, we do keep in mind that the recommendation to develop the church property on one acre would be far greater density than choosing an alternative for four acres at La Hacienda. Thank you for your open-mindedness and your courage to get this hot potato out for everybody to talk about. Thank you, Ms. Alvis. Francine Efren. Hello, my name is Francie Efren, and I live on Robles del Oro. I've been at numerous meetings on this very issue and greatly appreciate the hard work and the fairness in judgment exercised by council members to date. And here we are once again. My understanding of this issue is that we are looking at a proposal of maximum unprecedented density for the location. What I want to emphasize, and this is my main point, is that this density is not required to solve the housing element but is being considered in order to resolve a lawsuit. The requirements of the housing element were addressed and could have been resolved when the said property was approved by the council for zoning on an increased density of three units per acre. That appears to have been unacceptable to Mr. Stanley, who proceeded to file lawsuits to, in my opinion, make life difficult for the city in his quest to maximize his profit potential. While I understand that everyone has the right to make money, we as residents of the community and as homeowners sharing a property line with the property at issue also have rights and interests. We have invested most of our life savings and future retirement nest egg in our homes. We would like to maintain our property values and the safety of our streets by not having such a development in this location. This density right on Highway 9 would cause increased stress on already burgeoning traffic messes on Highway 9 putting both bikers and pedestrians and drivers at greater risk. This safety factor was an issue when it came to considering zoning of the church property. It is at least as threatening at this location where the speed limit is 45 miles per hour and there aren't even sidewalks or crosswalks or crossing guards on the highway. Further, such a dense development would greatly alter the character and beauty of this area. Mr. Stanley's tactic of suing the city and then proposing annexation and development of said property to settle the suit is, in my opinion, self-serving and actually offensive. He has created a distraction that has the council focused on resolving a lawsuit rather than meeting the housing element in a fair and minimally disruptive manner. While we've been working toward a compromise, Mr. Stanley has not. He turned down the compromise of the earlier council. If he cannot agree on a more acceptable density, I trust that with the brain power and resourcefulness of the council and community members, we should be able to find a solution to our housing issue. I refuse to believe there is no other solution than to put such a development, which is way in excess of the housing element requirements, in a location currently zoned for one home per acre. I do understand the expedient way is to sign off of this, on this proposal. Doing so would be to the extreme detriment of the neighboring homeowners and to the detriment of all community residents who would be negatively impacted. Please consider how any one of you would react to the idea of suddenly being faced with a development on your property line and street with a density as great as this. I suspect you may not be in favor of it. I urge you to reach a solution which is fair and geared toward the well-being of the entire community, not a single individual. Although we are the people most impacted by this proposal, somehow we don't have a vote, but you are our voice. Please support us. Do not acquiesce to this proposal. There are Thank other you. solutions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Terry McCarty. <clears throat> Can I uh, listen to a few more people before I come up? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and Marsha Wire. I'll pass. <clears throat> okay. Malcolm Stewart.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thanks again for uh, having me up here. Um, we submitted a petition with many signatures earlier today, so I won't go into uh, all the merits of that. I want to talk tonight about leadership in the face of bullying. Uh, in elementary school, we had a tough kid named Russ. He beat everybody up. He demanded lots of things, and he never gave in, and he increased his demands all the time. The only way you solved it was to stand up to him and punch above your weight class. This city has been manipulated and bullied. The leadership needs to stand up and say no. Hacienda Realty bought land on Highway 9. It's zoned R1 residential, not multifamily, not commercial. There's trees, there's open space, there's privacy. I'm an R1, Francie is too. We have one home per acre. So does the Hacienda property. He makes outrageous demands. When those aren't met, he files baseless lawsuits. The entire first set of claims in the lawsuit, all of them but one were lost, dismissed, with prejudice. For one minor issue, he has access to the data files at the city. That's it. He actually executed that by masquerading as a community advocate on behalf of housing while trying to maximize his profits. Again, he lost them all. He's also obstructed alternative sites. There's very good people on Dave's Avenue, and they're very concerned about their neighborhood, but they've been fed with fake facts, obfuscation, hyperbole. They're worried. Philip is over here at her age trying to maintain the integrity of her neighborhood because she's been told things that just aren't true. And now what do we have? We have a new lawsuit. It's such weak. One of the claims was already demurred with prejudice because you incorrectly executed your discretion. That's like telling somebody, I'm going to sue you because you have bad breath. He's getting weaker. He's on the ropes. These are worthless lawsuits. Don't settle this. Stand up to it. Settling now with him won't end this. The CEQA process will come up with some reason why there can only be 30 units, and then you'll have a lawsuit from him. The level of density here alone, 900%, it's spot zoning. It's unprecedented. Finally, once you do this, this ruins Highway 9, and it'll hopscotch all the way down the road. Developers like this that sue, that are bullies, they will be in front of every single house offering a check to buy land, and this entire highways, which is a California scenic highway that's supposed to be protected, it's going to look like San Jose, Milpitas. It'll look like El Camino Real. Stop the sprawl. Stop it here and stand up to him. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Treese. I'll be very brief. Just like a oh, no, come, come, come on up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, very brief. First, I applaud the city for um, hopefully abandoning any of the discussions on Dave's Avenue. I have certain reasons why I support not doing any development on the church property. Um, I just would like to have a point of clarification. Exactly what does the city need to do to meet the affordable dwelling unit um, requirements? How many units, what size, and so on. Could, at some point, could the city provide that and post that online so we can all see what that is? And, of course, the proposals to meet those. Thank you. Thank you. Bobby Greenberg. A lot of multiple speakers. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, a mo over a year ago, or about a year ago, we had a meeting here, a highly charged meeting, with I think more people than there are tonight, and the issue was Dave's Avenue and the church property. There were probably as many people opposed to it as there were for it. Uh, the uh, council elected to approve it, uh, and it moved forward. Uh, to the opposition of many. We're back to this time because I guess the council's reconsidering their decision and wants to change it uh, and agrees with those who opposed it before. Um, I, 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 I rise because my wife asked me to ask you guys a question. Have you done everything that you can do for the city? to see if there's an exclusion or an exception or something that can be done with the folks in Sacramento who are pushing the buttons and pulling the levers. Has anybody from uh, Monte Sereno been to Sacramento and met with anyone 
a senator, a congressman, anyone who's involved in the area that is passing this law that's requiring us to do it. Our city's a little unique. It's a uh, high-quality lifestyle, large property, um, small population that's nestled between two cities that are small, kind of rural. Uh, we've all seen what happened when uh, Los Gatos decided to pursue money and explode like crazy. And if you live on the thoroughfare, like I do, between Saratoga and Netflix or whatever's going to go into the North 40, you can see the traffic has dramatically increased. The same thing's going to happen on Highway 9. The second question I ask, and I would encourage you if you've not, would you please write a letter that all of the citizens, all of the homeowners could sign and tell us who to send it to so we can appeal to Sacramento for an exception. Lord knows they make enough exceptions for themselves. <laughs> the least they could do is make an exception for a city or a town. Um, so I, I just, uh, I don't know if we've done everything, and I, I'd like to see if we can revisit the first thing before we start running off and trying to say, well, it's Dave's Avenue, no, it's over here. The final question, in the housing requirement for multifamily housing, how many units are required, according to the state? Does anybody know? Well, we're not, we're not going to be answering questions oh, okay. real time, but we'll, we're well, going to collect question, all the questions. The question is, does it all have to be in one location? Okay. Could it all be right. spread out in multiple locations, three, 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 so forth? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Perry, you ready to go yet? Or do you want to get thrown down a couple of more notches? Pardon? You ready to go? Or? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just getting familiar with this issue, but, um, you know, it seems from all my reading that this is the same deal the guy asked for in the first place. So he hasn't compromised at all. He's asking the council to compromise. And the way this is going to go, I agree with the other gentleman here. I think it's a downhill stream once you start this. And I, 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 I think you'd be making a big mistake if you don't really feel that this is a good project over there to continue on. Um, I have a question, I, and I, you may not be able to answer, is what are the legal consequences if we lose in the lawsuit? We haven't heard that. Uh, and then what, are the oper what is the chance that we are going to lose? We haven't heard that either. And so I think that's something to be con considered. Um, you know, and also, I also have the same question. How many affordable units are really required? And um, why are we going to heavy density in that location just because some guy's losing? Actually, this really makes me mad. And, you know, I could see, and it won't be me, but you think you're getting out of one lawsuit, <laughs> you could be stepping into another one because somebody will decide they don't like the action you're taking and they're going to sue this guy and they'll have enough money to take them on. Okay? And I'm sure there's enough people in town that if they feel strongly about it, they will do that or they will combine forces. So you may be going from the frying pan into the, <laughs> into the fire when you get into this, and that's something else to think about. Uh, that's not a threat, uh, by the way. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I'm a, bus a businessman, <laughs> been here, done that, and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really something to think about as you go through this. Okay? Uh, I think it will get worse. All right. Thank you. What was his name? Um, Terry McCarty. There. Walter Huff. Walter Huff, 18137 Lexington. I'm still here. <laughs> um, I've heard about fairness tonight. I've heard about sweeping things underneath the rug. Um, I've, I've heard many things, but I haven't heard any facts. As a developer, I look at that piece of paper that's been submitted, and all that I see is drive-by photos of homes. 
I can challenge Mr. Stanley or anybody else to come and look at my project or anybody here. I'll make it available next week and take a look at one of my homes. It's outstanding. You said in your own words, Burton, that you don't know what it's going to look like, and yet you want to come to a compromise on something like this, and you don't know what it's going to look like. Mr. Stanley could have settled this years ago. In my opinion, had he been sincere, he could have showed you some plans that were outstanding, and that didn't happen. All that's happened is litigation <coughs> after litigation. He's turned Dave's avenues around, and he said these terrible things that this is going to happen. And I might remind everybody that the church says no on development, but the fact of it is they actually tried for an application to build, and we denied it some years ago. So there is some merit to the fact that it'll be built in some capacity, whether it's now or down the road. I think we have a plan and program right now that works. The, the thing that's interesting to me is that any time, excuse me, any time you do development, the very first thing you do is a schematic. You pay a lot of money for that schematic. These schematics are fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars per home or per multiple homes. On a project like this, it's not uncommon to spend a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I know. I do it. The fact that it's not in that program is a sham. And to set and compromise, this gentleman said it so well. He stated the fact that this is exactly where we began. And if you think that it's going to end on these units, you are sadly mistaken. And the other gentleman talked about a lawsuit. Um, I'm not implying a lawsuit as he does. But I can promise you this, with enough people that said, I think there will be another lawsuit. And I think you do a great injustice to the people on Dave's Avenue. I understand it. Mr. Green uh, talked. I would be concerned if I was on there. But the fact of the matter is, is that I don't think anything will be built there, I honestly believe, in the next 10 to 12 years. And it's something that we can look at because, Burton, you even said it yourself. At one time, this is going to be much more regional than it is going to be city. And again, I'm, I'm mixing some things up here, but we have no public transportation. Anytime you have multiple housing, the first thing that you need is some kind of multiple transportation. We have none of that. So I rest on the fact, do the right thing, don't approve this, and tell Mr. Stanley to get out of your sandbox. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Gary Efren. Right under the wire. Hi, uh, council members, uh, Mr. Mayor, neighbors. Uh, my name's Gary Efren. I live on Robles del Oro. Uh, I'm here to speak in opposition uh, to the proposal involving unprecedented density on the Hacienda property. This proposal isn't necessary to address the housing element. Okay. The proposal for unprecedented density is the byproduct of unnecessary and costly litigation initiated by a developer who wants to maximize his profit potential. Now, the city council faces a tough decision, but when faced with a difficult decision, it's the council's job, it's your responsibility, it's your obligation to thread the needle and reach an outcome that aligns with the character of the community. Jamming 36 units on this property serves only one person's best interest, the developer. Now, as I understand it, 97% of all California cities are not in compliance with the state's housing guidelines. And if that's the case, the state will have bigger fish to fry than Montessorino. Montessorino has about 1,200 residential units in the entire city. Approval of a project that increases the total housing units in the city by approximately 3% on just four acres defies logic. The baseball analogy of hitting a few singles rather than swinging for the fences seems spot on for this problem. If I could be as so bold as to suggest that the property that we're meeting in tonight could be an alternative site. It could be rezoned for a certain number of units. And then if a developer came along with an acceptable plan and made an attractive offer, the city could make progress with far less negative impact than the proposal on the table tonight. 
and there are, I'm sure there are other alternatives as well. I wouldn't mind driving to Dave's Avenue School or to the church or Las Gatas City Hall for a meeting. It would be okay with me. The council sets a horrible precedent if you allow this development to go forward. Don't let the distraction of this lawsuit keep you from doing the right thing for the city and opposing this plan. Thank you. Thank you. John Lutold. Thank you, Council Mayor, staff. Um, I just, uh, first of all, would like to thank the staff and uh, everyone for the excellent work trying to put together a process, and, and I want to reiterate that is a process that we're going forward. I think that's the right step here. Um, I do want to address um, some of the things that are untrue that you've been hearing here tonight. First of all, um, we had prior Mayor Lon Allen uh, state on his uh, materials before when he was running for office uh, that we were talking about 80 units on Mr. Stanley's lot. Um, that was obviously untrue. 35, 36 units is what was going to solve this problem in the first place many years ago before we had to go down this other route. Um, I think you all are very clear. You've received some sort of a petition uh, regarding this property. Last time when the Daves Avenue came up on short notice, the first petition we dropped on for the council to think about was 170 signatures that we raised in just a couple of days. Over 500 people um, worked on, uh, said that they want to see this on the ballot. It will be on the November ballot. It's very likely the church property will go away for, um, for this round and hopefully forever. So we do need to find a solution. This is a process. It's looking at this property to see if it can be resolved. Um, if the project is presented on time and brought in, we can all take a look at it and offer our opinions at that point. The other thing that's important here is the risk of going forward with the litigation with Mr. Stanley. Uh, the city doesn't have a real great record in terms of litigation. And um, this is another one that it could lose. If it loses, you might lose control over the 36 units that you've now got on the table and ready to lock in. So I think this is the right compromise. I applaud you for um, going forward with this process and plan. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Cratch. Hi, Jennifer Crock. It's okay. It happens Sorry. all the time. It can get worse, too. Uh, 18321 Lexington Drive. Um, I am a member of the Site and Architecture Commission of our fair city, and as a member of that commission, I am passionately interested in maintaining the nature and character of our beautiful, it's hard to call it a city, I call it a town. Um, when you look at what we had agreed to, the 15 units at Dave's with a completely already set infrastructure. It made perfect sense. It only needed to be zoned. Clarification, it only needs to be zoned. And then again, with the lawsuit, with the, you know, twist the arm behind the back, opened up a whole can of worms that didn't need to be opened. And I, for one, do not want to give in to somebody just because he threatens a lawsuit. I mean, that happens all the time. It's, it's a real problem. But I would prefer that we make a stand now than just let it go forward. And if we don't make a stand now, as some of the more eloquent speakers have maintained, it's just going to get worse, and we will lose all control. So I say that you vote against the, the um, agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn Purnham. Gentlemen, ladies. So I think what you guys are trying to consider and decide is whether or not we would annex an island in the, off the road uh, on Los Gatos Saratoga Road and put a development there that every single house that borders on that opposes. Doesn't sound like America to me. I, can't t I, I really can't tell you what I think it sounds like because there's a few ladies in the room, but it's just not right. <laughs> Secondarily, there is not a doubt in the world that if they get through the door on this, Route 9 is gone. So this relatively attractive highway that we can journey between two nice little towns is history. 
And if we poll the Saratoga residents, I'm going to tell you that more than 50 percent of them will be against this as well. And if we poll the people in the unincorporated areas, I'll bet you 90 percent of them are against it. And if you, uh, if you, if you poll the people in Montestrino, we've, we've, I heard about 500 signatures and 175 signatures. Well, a while back, myself and a half a dozen other guys got out and walked the neighborhoods, and we changed this council. That's how strongly we felt about this. And you guys are the, the people that came. And, and this, uh, this deal was supposed to be off the table. What are we talking about this for? I could be home you know, watching television, reading the book. You know, this is, this is just not a good thing. Now, you know, it turns out, you know, I spend a lot of time mentoring young kids going to college these days, mostly in engineering, and I tell them, uh, you know, if a doctor tells you you need a serious operation, what you need is another opinion. And when you walk into a room and you start talking to a professor, don't automatically think he's smarter than you. He may not be. And what, what these folks are more familiar with, nobody should think the banker is their best friend. But most importantly, we should not assume that Sacramento knows what's good for Montessorino because that is crap. And they're going to walk away from something the minute it serves their purposes. So we really need to think this out. I, I'm totally opposed to opening the process because when you open the process, lawyers who basically study the meaning of words are going to find a way to just start greasing the skids a little bit. And we've got no business going down that road. Monasterino doesn't want this. If we have to set up a committee and we have to go find some help figure out some other thing, fine, let's go do that. But let's not start a process that's going to lead to no place that Saratoga, the people that are going to live on the borders, and Monasterino residents are interested in. Why would we do that? Thank you. Uh, Karen Cannon. Hi. Karen Cannon. I live on Ravine Road in unincorporated Los Gatos, and I just wanted to voice my um, disapproval to the Hacienda Project. Um, as I was reading over your little um, write-up, uh, it seems that the EIR is exactly the same as it was in 2013. At that time, you did not approve it. You did not want it. Now it seems like you do. Um, and I would just be interested, I understand you're not answering questions today, but I would really be interested to know why you are willing to even um, look at this proposal if your position hasn't changed. And that's all I wanted to say. So my suggestion is don't approve it. Sally Goodfriend. Nope. Nope. Oh, yes, he is. All right. We'll give you. We'll give you all the time you need. Good evening, council and staff. My name is Sally Goodfriend. I live on the corner of Ridgecrest and Hillvale. And I lived here for 45 years. I love my acre and a third. And I like what Monte Serino used to stand for, where we had our privacy, we had our acre, and we didn't have high density. I've dealt, over the 45 years, I've dealt with quite a few councils. And there have been high points, and unfortunately, sometimes there were low points. But this new proposed agreement with Hacienda Realty, where Mr. Stanley will drop his lawsuit if Monte Serino plays ball his way, this hits the bottom of my low scale. In view of the past history of objections by many residents against any proposed overdevelopment of the Hacienda property, it is disturbing that this council and staff would proceed to negotiate with Hacienda's new settlement agreement without having a single public hearing or even letting people know about the lawsuit and that Stanley would drop his lawsuit in exchange that we play ball his way. 36 units is way too much for that property. I also object that you did, I only found out about this whole meeting and what you were proposing to vote on on Friday. Many residents, like myself, we don't do computers. We don't know about this unless somebody calls us. This meeting really deserved a letter addressed to every resident of what you are proposing to vote on tonight. You are opening the door on a slippery slope. A precedent will be set for future blackmail opportunities for any developer who doesn't get his way the first time around. 
your proposal isn't approved, come back and do another proposal. It's not approved again, throw a hissy fit and file a lawsuit. Throw another hissy fit and then come back and say, okay, I'll drop my lawsuit if you do it my way this time. I feel that a public hearing should be held now before the council votes tonight. Holding public hearings after an affirmation vote invites more problems and possible lawsuits down the road. It might even be a good idea to put this whole thing on hold until after the November ballot on the Baptist church issue, or this whole issue should really go before the whole city of Monte Serena and all the residents. Thank you. Thank you. Lum. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members and neighbors. My wife and I decided that for simplicity, only one of us would have to speak. We do agree on all the issue and the things that what we're going to say. Okay, so therefore, I will uh, I'll be the only one to speak. But she's up here to support me to say that she agrees with that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, we have followed this uh, from time to time, not completely in all details. Okay. We definitely, first, we want to say that we oppose the proposal as it is given. We know that the issue has been going on for many years, and it has been the, 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 the council just rejected it okay, from the developers okay, several times, I think. Okay. Now, uh, uh, we, we have been in the, in the city of Mano Sereno for almost close to half a century. Okay. When we decided to move from San Jose to Mano Sereno, we searched the whole county and decided this is what we want. This is the city. It had characteristic, the kind that we would like. So we built our house at that time and have been in the house ever since. Now, the city has one thing. It's a very, very low density. It has a very nice characteristic of a small city. And it really is beautiful and completely green. In there. Now, I don't understand. We don't understand why the the city and the staff even suggesting that we should accept the proposal. The way that it seems to be sent to me is that they do it. Is it because the, the, the pressure from the developer, or is it the lawsuit, or whatever else? I couldn't find any reason for that justification to suggest that we should go ahead with this. Okay? Even though down the road you will have hearing and things like that. But even a preliminary sort of okay, indication of approval is our character, as far as I see. It, it would completely, in the future, starting from this, would probably destroy the whole characteristic of Minus Serino. We have been very proud, and all we have been very proud, to tell people we live in Minus Serino and the characteristic of Minus Serino that's not nowhere else that's available in the whole county. Okay. Not even think of those high, high expensive uh, communities that com can compare to us like this. Thing. So I, I don't understand why. Isn't there okay, any other way that we can do it? Because as the previous speaker said, uh, over 97 percent of California is not moving ahead like this. Okay? Why do we have the Russian? No, okay. I'm, I'm not opposed to negotiation with the developer for something reasonable. But such a high density is even worse than the track houses in San Jose. High density track houses. Why do we do that? Why, do, why does the council seem to indicate that we're willing to go ahead and accept this kind of proposal? 
and why the staff even suggested that the council should accept it. We, we fail to see the reason and the logic, and uh, we are afraid that okay, if we do this, when it's the first step going to lead to the destruction of the characteristic of Minas Arena that we are so proud of. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Edward Foshin. Hi, Mr. Mayor, Council, staff. Uh, I love this town. You know, these are my neighbors. I know a couple of them, and I've lived here uh, since 1988. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I agree with Mr. Huff that uh, I'm a developer myself in this town and um, have done several spec homes over in Willow Glen area. Uh, a project of this size would have a roll of plans about this big and have all kinds of uh, elements in there that would be able to be descriptive of that size of a project, and it would cost about $100,000 or more for a project like that. And that would be soft costs that you would have to outlay uh, prior to having any comfort for any town to approve this. Um, one of the things that um, maybe you can correct me, but uh, this whole high density housing or affordable housing act, uh, I believe is, if you look at the legalese, is uh, very similar to a in lieu of taxation, where if you don't do it, you don't get federal funds or state funding. Um, I think it's time to stand up and say no, as some of my neighbors have said. Um, for our community, I don't know if it's 97 percent, but I know it's a great percent of the cities in this state that don't fall in line with that mandatory uh, housing element. Um, one of the things that no one has mentioned here is the infrastructure impact that a development like this would do. I live on Vista Avenue, and I have, uh, I don't know, 100 or more cars coming down Poppy and my street and on Bruce every morning between a quarter to 8 and 8.30, and then again in the afternoon to pick up kids. And uh, a housing development like this or a density housing at the church would increase that intersection to where two cross guards wouldn't be enough. You're going to need a dozen of them because it's just going to impact it that much further with traffic. You cannot, I can't even drive down Poppy Avenue at all right now in the morning. I have to go the other way. If I want to go over to Cave and I have to go around because there's no way to get there unless it takes 15 minutes because people are waiting to turn into the parking lot. So uh, that's another element that, that I'm completely against. So I applaud you guys for um, being courageous and taking this on, but um, as I, as, um, I don't remember who said, uh, but he has been a bully, and as a developer in the past, I know that if he's got this property tied up, it's costing him a great deal of money every month uh, in money, in cost, and in, uh, outlay that he's putting out and not being able to develop it. So one way to get around this, as opposed to putting in the $25,000 and paying for this uh, lawsuit, um, however you phrase that, I don't remember how you phrase that exactly, is just to um, shelf it and just let him stew, and eventually he's going to go away because he can't afford it. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I have... Uh, Two cards left, so if anybody else would like to speak, if they would like to bring a card forward, that would be great. Uh, Dan Turkis. Hi, thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm one of these that I say, look at the traffic on 9 now. Try to get into Los Gatos at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. You can't go there. And now you're going to, they want to head, I don't know how many more cars this subdivision is going to add, but all of a sudden you can't get there. Uh, I've been a resident of the county for over 40 years, but I have to go through Montessorino to get out. So, you know, I live up on Lucky Road, and I feel lucky to be up there. I love the way Montessorino is. I'm a real estate, actually retired real estate person and brought a lot of people into this town because of how quiet and nice and big lots and how beautiful it is here. And I would all of a sudden hate to be called a liar that I brought them in, and now all of a sudden we're going to have a development like this at La Hacienda. Uh, isn't, and I also thought that La Hacienda was owned commercial, 
and why we're going after residential at this point in time, just tell them to go away. That's, and I agree with everybody else that's against this, and I would also recommend that you vote against it as well. Thank you very much. Okay, Greg Hall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council staff. I'm Greg Hall, 16248 Oakhurst. I have just really a couple of things that are focused on procedure. Uh, the first thing is we would like to be updated on the status of any litigations going on here in Monte Serena. We don't want to be the last people on the deal team. The second thing is I'd like you to take annexation off of this. Annexation should not be part of this evaluation. You're lumping everything together. Annexation belongs as a separate line item after everything is done. And it may be that it needs to go on the ballot. Because when you think about it, Stanley doesn't have any standing, really. He's not part of the city. Okay, he's over there. He's arguing things. He's, you know, costing us money. And a precondition should be that he should pay us. We want to be reimbursed. How much has he cost us? Probably about $2 million in legal fees. Before Stanley really wants to be part of our city, let's negotiate with him. Let's ask for about $2 million. Let's get all of our legal fees back. I mean, he took our good intention of the Dave's Avenue pre-zoning. Okay, we went over there and we said, oh, we're going to comply with the housing element. We're going to put a high-density pre-zoning in. His lawyer takes that, amends his complaint, and then comes back at us. How much, how, how much did that cost us? I mean, let's get smart about it. I mean, we're dealing with somebody who, you know, he's in for profit, but... You know, listen, I've been doing this. I have been doing this since I was 32 years old. I'm 60 now, okay? I go back to the Winkler era, you know? Uh, I, I go back a long ways fighting this case. I'm not opposed to a development down there, but we don't want 36 units. If he wants to do something like the Saratoga Legends, if he wants to do R18 or something like that, we're open, okay? He can make money. He could build a whole number of $3 million houses <coughs> down there. But this high-density stuff really doesn't fit in here. And I want to commend everybody who's spoken tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Amir Ajani. Mr. Mayor, members. I want to state my position to this. I'm, I'm opposed to this. However, and I love my neighbors, I have one acre property that is adjoining to this property. If you approve this, I'm going to be the next person filing for nine units on my property. Because I don't want to lose the value of my investment that I've done there, and I want my money back, so that's coming to you next. So, you know. Thank you. Ed Turner. Uh, 15232 Stratford Court. Sorry I missed some of the discussion tonight. Uh, probably not going to be very popular here tonight, but I feel like we're between a rock and a hard place with this. This is really about satisfying the housing element. And if there is a way to tell the state to go take a long walk off a short pier, I would support you guys totally in doing that. But I don't think there is. I think that the rezoning of the Baptist Church was a truly egregious mistake. And, and I think that's going to be corrected. If it goes to ballot, I think it'll get fixed. <clears throat> if, they ever, if it doesn't and they ever actually, the church ever actually does sell that property, and they put multifamily units on that whole place, you're going to end up with 40, 50, maybe 60 units there. That's going to be a nightmare. I think that, that what uh, is proposed for La Hacienda is a reasonable alternative. 
Maybe it shouldn't be 36. Maybe it should be something smaller than that. I don't know. But I think doing the, this is a reasonable alternative. And I think you guys did a lot of work and a good job in coming up with, with this proposal and working through it with Mr. Stanley. What we have there now, and I haven't heard anybody talk about this, but what we have there now is a 20-unit transient motel. And that, I mean, for me, that's a, that's a serious problem. How often do those people turn over? Every few months, maybe? We don't know who they are. There's no stability. And then we've got our, a bar and a restaurant where we've got 1,000 people on Friday and Saturday nights showing up there with the traffic to match. Um, it just seems to me that a nice development there is strongly preferable to what we have there now with the, with the motel and the, and the restaurant. So I would support this position. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so that's all of the cards that I have. Oh, we got a latecomer. It's another one. <laughs> Hi, Brian Mekachuk, Via Serino. Um, I know that council has spent a lot of time dealing with this and other issues, and it only seems to get more complex. And I think there's a lot of facets to this that a lot of the people in the room don't understand. Um, I think that, that Russ is continuing to go at one end of the spectrum, and I would propose that uh, this go ahead, but there be a couple of neighborhood outreach meetings so that he can propose the, he can spend the money, the $100,000 or whatever it is, so that he can put together a good proposal and he can work with the commu community on what can work. Because I think if everyone's being reasonable, as the last gentleman just said, you know, something can, positive can come of this. So, although I, I hate to play this or else with someone because I'll take or else every time, having said that, I think we're in a difficult situation, and if this is a way to move forward in the next six months or five months, maybe we should do that. But I would, I would ask that there be several community outreach meetings during that time so that he can say, here's what I'd like to do. He can get the imp input, and then there's no surprises at the end if everyone if he doesn't compromise on it and he says, here's what it is, and he stays at that end of the spectrum being the highest density. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to bring it back to council. And uh, I would like to ask staff if, because uh, I saw them diligently writing down some of the questions that were posed, if they have the ability to answer any of them. Sure, uh, just a few points of clarification. So the Hacienda site is currently zoned for three units per acre. I think one of the speakers mentioned it was one unit per acre, but uh, it is currently three units per acre. Um, compliance with the housing element. So our current housing element was adopted in 2015, and that housing element requires that we provide multifamily housing somewhere in the city of Monasterino. The issue with Monasterino has not been affordability, which might seem... Um, strange given the homes in Monasterino, but actually it is not an affordability issue. Rather, it is a variety of housing type issue. So in 2015, we did propose rezoning a portion of the First Baptist Church property to provide a multifamily housing opportunity. And we determined that 15 units could fit on that site. So we're looking, um, if we were to look at an alternative site, it would need to have at least 15 multifamily units. Um, Sacramento. Uh, so this is uh, not a new issue for many of you. We've been dealing with the um, requirements of the housing element for more than a decade. Um, and every time there's a new housing element requirement, we deal with Sacramento and those same questions are asked in terms of what can we do? Have we said no to Sacramento? Have you met with Sacramento? What have you done? And we did uh, go up and meet with Sac in Sacramento with the um, HCD, which is the Housing and Community Development Department, to try to explain the uniqueness of Montesorino. That was when we approved the 2010 housing element. Um, at that time, frankly, they didn't care. And given the current climate and the current housing shortage um, in the state of California, I am 
confident that they care even less now than they did in 2010. Um, the housing. How, how many times have we met with them? I, I know since in, I've been on the council, it's been. I believe we've twice. met with them in person twice, uh, but we have had numerous phone calls with um, one particular individual who is um, the head of the housing element division. Um, Given the current climate, um, as the council is aware, in 2017, there was um, a housing bill that was passed that makes it even easier for housing and developers to build in the state of California in an attempt to try to address the housing shortage issue. So um, the city's control over development in um, California will get harder and harder, and we will have less and less discretion. So um, we have tried to explain to Sacramento why we're unique, why multifamily housing doesn't work here. We don't have transportation. We don't have jobs. Um, and they didn't care. So we have addressed that. We addressed it in 2010 in the way that we felt was most appropriate. And we addressed it again in 2015 uh, when we designated the church as a, a site for potential multifamily housing. Um, legal consequences if we lose. So the current, uh, the, the most recent amended complaint alleges that the actions to rezone the church um, were in violation of state law and inappropriate because the church will not actually ever be built. So it should not be considered viable for multifamily housing development. Um, if Mr. Stanley is successful, we would then have to look for an alternative site to provide multifamily housing up to at least 15 units. Um, and in addition to that, we would be required to pay his attorney's fees. Um, and along with those attorney's fees, oftentimes there is a multiplier, which can multiply the amount of attorney's fees depending on um, the importance of the issue. So I, we would suspect there would be a multiplier, at least requested, um, if not awarded by the court. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what it's going to look like, and we haven't received the $100,000 worth of plans yet because they haven't submitted an application. So uh, we will be, under this agreement, if you are to approve it, we will be getting that um, on February 16th. Um, and it, it should be quite large and um, very detailed. 97% uh, of the cities don't comply. I don't know what that percentage is. I do not believe it's that high, um, but I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. And I think that was it. All right. Thank you very much. Any uh, comments from council or questions for staff? Would anybody like to make a motion? I have comments. Would love to hear them. Thank you. Um, this odyssey uh, for me started back in 2008 uh, when I, uh, I won't say mistakenly, but because I knew what I was doing, but I did apply to uh, fill the empty seat of Alan Arts when he had to step down from the council and, um, and, and served actually, I think, you know, longest and I'm termed out in November or December. Uh, whenever the next council gets sworn in, <clears throat> but I've been through uh, a pretty long history with this entire project um, process, I should say, not not project, because the curious the curious thing about it is, since 2008 until tonight, there has never been an application filed, never an application filed for this particular project, um, and what I see happening this evening is that. You know, the city is being asked. We were proposed by Mr. Stanley and La Hacienda, real, the, the, the entity, uh, to entertain a settlement of, uh, of the third lawsuit that's been filed uh, in exchange for filing an application. Well, an application could be filed tomorrow if anyone, does, if he decided to file an application. Uh, without necessarily the exchange of, a, of dismissing, potentially dismissing the lawsuit. Uh, the litigation has, contrary to what's been said this evening, has not been successful. There were two lawsuits that were originally filed. We were successful in winning all of the issues except for one issue where we refused to produce 
uh, certain public records because the request was to get copies of the plans for some of the homes that many of you submitted to the city with the idea that they would probably be kept confidential. And we made that argument to the judge, and the judge disagreed with us, said that those were public records and that he was entitled to those, and we had to pay, uh, I think it was approximately $60,000 in attorney's fees. Aside from that, uh, I, I heard the number of $2 million that we've spent defending the cases. Uh, the research that I did, uh, just to be transparent about what we've spent, uh, we've spent about $264,000 defending the lawsuits to date and uh, an additional $50,000 from uh, our city attorney. So it's, it's approximately $300,000, a little more than that, that we've spent defending the case cases up to this point. Uh, in addition to that, and, and this, is, this is one of the things that to me is pretty staggering about what we're exchanging uh, or what we're being asked to exchange and in, 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 uh, in, to allow an application to be filed, which frankly tomorrow could be filed without dropping the lawsuit, is we had 321 separate requests for production of public records, uh, which is unprecedented for our city. And produced, and, and, and you know, staff had to spend countless hours copying documents, making them available, and certainly any citizen has a right to make public record requests. But these came, you know, in in an effort to support, uh, you know, potentially the litigation that was going on, or simply to uh, to get a lot of it information. But certainly was a tremendous distraction to the city uh, with respect to to many of those requests. Uh, you know, the history, if you go back to this and look at what, what happened, you know, I accompanied city, uh, city attorney to Sacramento. Uh, I could not believe that the HCD was really trying to tell us what we had to do to develop our city. And I was there with, with Kirsten. I was there with Brian Loventhal, our city manager at the time, and also an outside counsel that we brought with us from Oakland who was a specialist in dealing with housing element issues. And we sat there across the table from three or four of the people at HCD, lifetime bureaucrats, it seems. Mm -hmm. And they, I asked them, Did you ever, have you ever been to Monte Sereno? And the answer was no. And I said, do you know how much public transportation we have in Monte Sereno? And they said no. And I said, do you know how many jobs we have in Monte Sereno? And they said no. I said, well, we don't have any jobs other than working for the city or a part-time job at the post office, which we did have back then. Uh, so the bottom line was they just didn't know, but they were still imposing upon us what they, what they wanted done. Uh, and at that point in time, we knew we had to do something, and we did do something. We held, as many of you were in attendance, a hearing at Dave's Avenue School <laughs> where I think, you know, we probably had close to 60, 70, 80, 90 people speaking that evening. It went on until after 11 o'clock in the evening. Hopefully tonight won't, but we did then. And we had identified, the city had identified, because we were trying to comply with what the state was telling us. And we had sites selected around the city where we could possibly do some multifamily housing. Maybe, you know, two units or a duplex or triplex would be satisfactory. And uh, every neighborhood, every, every site that we s selected in the city had uh, the residents that lived, you know, a couple houses around there come in and say, not in my backyard. And that was the theme for the entire evening. And nobody wanted that. Shortly thereafter, and this goes back to, let me get the date to be accurate. Uh, it was in August of 2013. 2013, August, almost five years ago the city council voted to rezone, or pre-zone rather, the La Hacienda property to allow, as, as our esteemed city attorney told us, how many units per acre could be built there. And we pre-zoned that property with the idea of striking a compromise, knowing that it was uh, one house per acre, basically. We said we would allow three units per acre as long as they didn't really exceed the, the size of what a single-family home could be on, on any one of those lots. That was in 2015. Not since then had we received an application. And what we did receive was another lawsuit and then another lawsuit. Uh, and frankly, what I've seen in the last lawsuit, uh, you know, I've been practicing law for over 40 years, and I don't think that lawsuit has much merit to it, and I frankly don't think it warrants... Uh, uh, an agreement like the one that's been placed on the agenda this evening. So 
as one city council member uh, who has been living with this thing for for almost 10 years, uh, you know, I, I am opposed to to the uh, to the matter that's on the agenda this evening. Worst case scenario, uh, we end up going forward with with a, a plan. And again, I'm not talking about density because that's not the issue this evening. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. Tonight, it's trading a lawsuit for filing of an application. And if the application ultimately isn't approved, then perhaps we're back into the litigation mode. And frankly, if we have an election uh, that goes forward on the referendum, as it relates to the church property that, that we rezoned uh, uh, about a year ago, uh, if that is a successful vote to uh, basically undo what the city council did, we will start the process all over again and go to all of our citizens and say, where do you want to build it? Because uh, that's where we would be. And, uh, and HCD, the state may say we're not in compliance, but w you know, we'll take that one as it comes. Uh, but in any event, uh, you know, that to me is, 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 is where we end up on this. But to settle a lawsuit that I think, in, in my opinion, uh, we don't get anything for it other than just not spending a little bit more on attorney's fees. And, um, and I, I think that the history here has been, you know, has permitted uh, the ability to file an application for, you know, for more than a decade, and none's been filed. So uh, I'm opposed. Would anybody else like to make a comment? All right, so I, I would like to just first of all thank the staff for all of their hard work and thank my fellow council members. They've done a, a great job in looking at this over the, the past, oh gosh, I don't know how many how many months that we've worked on this particular topic. Uh, I know that uh, along with council member Ann Standing, I've been doing it for seven years. And I know council member Rogers has been working on it for four plus a couple. And so we, we put a lot of time in this. This isn't something that just hit, hit, hit our desks on Friday like you all got it. I mean, this is something that we've been working on for a long time. So again, thank you very much to everybody for all of their hard work. So at this time, I'd like to see if there's a motion on the table. And what would the motion be? <laughs> So the uh, first motion would be to either um, approve or deny the processing and settlement agreement. And then if you approved the agreement, then a second motion would be needed regarding the EMC planning con uh, professional services contract. And that would just be a motion to approve. Okay. All right. So what? Um so do we make a motion? So if you accept the motion, you would just say, so moved. Okay. So moved. Okay, so we have a motion. I gave two yeah. choices, sorry, for the first one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, it so would, unmoved. So it would either, so uh, the motion would be um, a motion to approve the processing and settlement agreement with Hacienda Realty and Russell Stanley. That's one option. Or... Do we motion. want to break them apart? Well, that, well, so that would be if you if you're in favor of it, that would be your motion. If you're opposed to it, your motion would be a motion to deny the processing agreement. So the motion is to deny the processing agreement. No. If, if no. someone wants to make that motion, someone. they could. It, you're either going to make a motion to approve it or to deny it. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve the processing agreement, and then we'll see where we go from there. Is there a second? I second. All right, so we have a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right, I'd like to have a roll call vote, please. Okay. Do it by random. So be council member, council member Turner? Yes. Council member Craig? Yes. Council member uh, Ann Standig? No. Council member Holsheimer? Yes. Council Member Rogers. I'm going to vote no. Okay, so the motion passes three to two. So now the next motion would be to accept or, or to engage EMC Consulting. 
the motion would be to approve the professional services contract with EMC Planning Group. Okay. I, why, why don't we take a, a short recess? Yeah, and let's go back. Well, do you want to just do that? If you do that one, then we'll be done. We can move on. Okay. Just do it right now? Yeah. Rowena. Rowena? Then we can clean all this out. All right. Okay. So moved. Okay. So we're, we're, I made a motion that we approve engaging EMC to produce the EIR report. Can, can, can I make an amendment to the motion? I don't know if it's been seconded yet, but I'd like to make an amendment. To the EMC contract? Yes. So if, if you can propose it and if the maker of the motion and the second approves, then okay. you can. I would, I would propose, because I did not see it in the agreement, that uh, there be some type of escrow that would be required of the applicant to pay any additional funds beyond the 25000 since it's anticipated the cost could run up to $100,000. Okay. And, and would that be possible to put that? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're still, we we're still negotiating, we're, excuse me, we're still discussing the item. So we could require, uh, it is part of the requirements for the application that they do deposit those funds, um, but we could include that in the motion as well. Okay, I will amend my motion. Does the second accept that also? Yes. Okay. Let's wait for a couple more people. Okay, can I have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Councilmember Ann Standig? Yes. Councilmember Mayor Craig? Yes. Councilmember Turner? Yes. Councilmember Rogers? Yes. And Councilmember Bullshimmer? Yes. All right. That's Thank you. At this time, I'd like to take a brief recess, and we will continue with item number five. So we'll take about a five, six minute break. All right, let's finish this off. We're live. Gone. Well, let me. Gone. There's an audience right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody at Monte Serino Webland. <laughs> Thank you for staying with us tonight. KMSO on the air. All right, item number five. <laughs> Formation of the West Valley Clean Water Program Authority. And I will let staff take this one. And actually, I'll do a super abbreviated uh, staff report unless the council wishes I do more. Um, but basically, this is item is for the formation of the West Valley Clean Water Program Authority. And this is the authorization to execute a joint uh, powers agreement forming the West Valley Clean Water program authority and appoint a representative and an alternate to the, to the, to the newly formed board. Um, for many years, the West Valley communities of Campbell, Los Gatos, Mono Serena, and Saratoga have worked cooperatively to uh, implementing and managing stormwater services in these uh, four jurisdictions. Last year, the board of directors of the West Valley Sanitation District uh, voted in May uh, to withdraw from the West Valley Clean Water Program and determinate the district's participation in the various illegal agreements related to the clean water program. Since that time, staff has worked with the other cities, public works directors, uh, city attorneys, to come up with a, an alternative. And what we've come up with is to basically keep the clean water program intact. It has actually moved from next door to the city of Campbell. Uh, and to move the uh, authority over it uh, to, a, to a new joint powers authority. And so what, so what we're here tonight uh, and have scout staff has brought before you is consideration of this um, new Joint Powers Authority. I believe uh, one, of the, one of the cities is reviewing it tonight and two others in like this tomorrow. So, so uh, all four cities are, uh, are considering um, this tonight and tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions for staff? Okay. Um, the co can I make a comment now? Or? Sure. Just comment, question. Because um, I'm going to be involved in this because I, I can be the 
person representing the city because it's got kind of going right after the solid waste. And so I had called Kirsten to. Oh, hang on one second. Can you follow up on that just a little bit? So uh, the idea behind um, the thinking in this is to combine the same board member that's on the solid waste JPA to also be appointed to the clean water program JPA. Uh, some of the work that is done in both those areas are related. And so the, the idea is that the meeting would be, um, they would follow each other. So we would keep the same board members um, and just run through both agendas. We anticipate they will meet, it, the clean water program will meet quarterly. Um, there will be a meeting probably in Mar the end of March to set up rules, conflicts of interest code, those types of things. And then we'll start on a regular schedule in May and meet the same days that the solid waste JPA meets. All right, so Council Member Rogers, you're the... Well, okay, I shouldn't be presumptuous on this. I mean, if you guys want, someone else <laughs> no, wants no. to do it, that's fine, but it would be a real hassle because it's going to follow the other meetings. Right, so, and that, so. Was, that, that was sort of what we were hoping for, is that whoever does that would volunteer to continue. Yeah, and it. I did, I volunteered, I, and, but if you guys want to do it, someone else, I'm... I'm would anybody else like to take it on? So this one is is the project that we moved off the West Valley Sanitation District, right? Correct. Okay. So I am the chairman of the West Valley Sanitation District. So this would the, the meetings would follow immediately after the West Valley Sanitation District. No, they're uh, going to follow immediately after the West waste. Valley after Solid West Waste. Valley, yes. yes, yes, not the Sanitation not District, the, sanitation. the Solid Waste meeting. So, so it yeah. although anyone else could be on it, it it. Make just sense. makes more sense because we won't know exactly when the other meeting ends, and it just would be um, more convenient, I think, for all involved if, yeah. if we could do it that I'm way. I'm happy to be on it, but I'm also happy if someone else wants to do it. I'll relinquish because because it just makes sense for me to do it. But I but if someone really wants to do it, I'll, I'll step back. I don't care. Okay, so, so the motion would be to approve the JPA and to assign Council Member Rogers as the representative and then um, who's the alternate the who's the alternate solid waste alternate solid is waste. who wants to oh who's oh, who currently who's is the there? alternative who for solid is? waste I, I can't remember say that again who's, who's, who's the who's alternate my, is it you Rowena I, I am I am the chairman of the West Valley no no <laughs> yes but but what about for the solid waste who's the <laughs> does anybody Andrew is looking so how about this the motion would be to uh, to authorize the city manager to execute the clean water program JPA agreement and to appoint as board member and alternate those members that are currently on the solid waste yes. board as the board member and the alternate I second that <laughs> wait a second we need a motion yeah. anybody I that <laughs> do we have a so moved That's what I thought. Okay. So what did you just vote on? Nothing yet. So the motion so. would be to approve, authorize the city manager to execute the Clean Water Program Joint Powers Agreement and to appoint Council Member Rogers as the board member and Council Member Turner as the alternate. So moved. Second. Okay. He actually, did you still want to second it? Or? I'd sign Okay, it. we got it. All in favor. Aye. 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 All right, and number six, the San Jose Water Company general rate case application. Click, 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 staff report. So um, this is regarding San Jose Water Company general rate case application A1801004. Uh, San Jose Water Company filed general rate this general rate case application in January of this year at the request of one of the city's council members staff is seeking direction from the city council regarding transmitting a letter to the California Public Utilities Commission protesting the application so we uh, we're recommending that you discuss it and let us know if you want us to transmit a letter in our position okay are we pretty much going to send the same letter as we've sent in the past has has any other city circulated a template to to do something about this yet? I haven't seen one. There may be, and I can certainly look for it okay. if, if you would like. Um, would anybody? Yeah, I saw one yesterday from, the, from Saratoga, from the Rish Kumar. 
Okay. Greasy yeah. Okay. Um, anybody have questions or comments for staff? Okay. Do we have to have the letter before we make this motion? And I remember so, one time we had to have a special meeting to sign right. the letter. So you could authorize the mayor to execute a letter in opposition of the current rate request, um, similar to the city of Saratoga letter that was sent. So moved. I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Then we are on to committee commission reports, right? Who would like to start? We'll start on okay. the left side. I'm going to be brief because everybody wants to get out of here, but I did do three things to make up for the last three meetings that I did nothing. <laughs> so um, youth commission meeting, um, we planning spring activities with a movie night, which was good. Um, they also had an ecology seminar in Oakland that uh, not too many of our guys are attending, but we can encourage that. And also a joint meeting. This was the most interesting thing. A joint meeting with the Los Gatos Youth Commission where Evan Lowe, our assemblyman, is, is going to be there. And he's going to talk to them about an assembly bill that he's trying to pass to lower the voting age to 17. And, and I could get into all the reasons for that, but I won't. But um, it's worth looking into. Santa Clara Wa Valley Water District I went to. Um, big discussion on what cost. Oh, that's, that, was, that was fine, the delicious lunch. It was great. Um, anyways, what, con <laughs> what constitutes a drought, um, and that's groundwater basically, and when are we in a drought, and then assorted uh, presentations on clean, clean water and other issues. It was two hours of interesting stuff. Um, and then West Valley Solid Waste, I think the only thing, the most important thing that came out of that is in the future there's going to be state-mandated um, composting issues which will require us to have garbage cans with separate parts in it. And the thing that's most important of this besides, you know, what it does for the ecology and everything is the increase in price to end up doing something like that. And that could be substantial, but we're going to figure out a way, if it does happen, to kind of ease it into the rates. And lastly, I was appointed the um, vice chairman of the commission. So, okay, that's that. Oh, congratulations! Great. Uh, <laughs> Councilmember Ann Standing. I have nothing to report. Nothing, Councilmember Wilshimer. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Rogers for sending in at the uh, uh, Water Commission or Water Board, as we sometimes refer to it. Uh, mm -hmm. I had eye surgery that day, so I Being could not attend. <laughs> it went very well. Thank you. Uh, the animal control um, board was canceled for lack of a quorum. So we made the trip. Santa Three Claire. of us made the trip. Santa Clara yeah. wasn't there. I won't mention names. <sighs> yeah. We had no quorum, so the meeting was canceled. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Turner. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the South Flow Airport traffic. Um, it, it, it's a very difficult problem. We can't just move traffic and disperse traffic all around because we're connected to San Francisco. San Francisco determines the, the flow of traffic in the air, and the FAA will just say yes or no. So what happened is the city of, of Mountain View and Cupertino hired a consultant to figure out what types of airplane actually make the noise without having to move anything else. Of course, I didn't volunteer any money to, for that project. <laughs> Okay, and I attended the Silicon Valley Regional Interoperability Association, and um, I guess because I attend all the meetings, they made me chairman again. So, congratulations! Uh, but but the good news is that they are very very close to completing their loop again. This is the this is the uh, commission that oversees the the new system of radios that all of the county agencies, including uh, VTA and any other emergency operation type organizations, and they'll be able to communicate throughout the entire entire county. And we're even uh, beginning the hook so that we could tie into Alameda and San Mateo. So uh, police officer Gilroy could get on the radio and say, hey, there's this guy heading north and the guys in San Jose will be able to talk directly to him instead of relaying through a dispatcher and we've already had some successful tests at the Super Bowl when it was here a couple of years ago um, we've uh, 
We're really just waiting for PG and E. I, I didn't think this was so so such a big problem, but basically we are waiting for PG and E to literally come out to the site and go, uh, yeah, run a wire from here down under the ground and then put it in here and then plug it in and we'll come and energize it. And they still haven't done it. It's been about six months and it doesn't seem like any amount of prodding or or cajoling and saying, hey, you know, this is integral to the emergency operations uh, of of Santa Clara County doesn't seem to move these guys at all, um, but you know we're gonna we're gonna keep trying to push the buttons to make that happen. Uh, library meeting we had a, a five year budget projection. We had a very uh, we had a very spirited discussion. The library uh, purchased two buildings about six years ago. One of the buildings had been leased to the VFW for the last six years at no charge. Uh, we finally were. Um, able to take the building back over and now we're uh, debating what we would like to do with it. We looked at three construction plans. Uh, we picked the medium construction plan which will include uh, expanding the space of the library along with some conference space. And also uh, coming up next month, if you have a library, fine. Uh, it's going to be uh, a library amnesty month. So go get all your fines taken care of. Is that nationwide? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Los Gatos actually has one too, I noticed, but I'm not on any commissions related to that. But, but a number of a number of uh, county library systems are are doing that. Okay, uh, council member comments. Anybody have a comment? Okay, and just one quick comment for me. Uh, you will notice that on your in front of you, you have a little <laughs> card called Philantro Pizza. And this was given out by the Santa Clara County Library Foundation. And for the next three months, if you eat at the California Pizza Kitchen at Valley Fair, and it's only the Valley Fair location, 1% oh. of your tab will go to the Santa Clara County Library Foundation, which was formed recently to just help expand the programs and materials that the uh, library offers. And then also there is a bookmark, uh, Silicon Valley Reads starts up... Uh, this month. And so there's a number of recommendations. This is a cool bookmark for you to have to when you're reading your books. And um, I did attend the Library Foundation uh, presentation that they had last weekend. And one of the main reasons I wanted to attend it is because Joe Simidian did his, I, I guess I, people call it the, the, the famous dealing uh, in a world of Trump. And if you haven't ever heard it before, it really is, it really is quite um, enlightening. Um, I have found it online and I'll send you guys a copy of it because everywhere he's done it, it's been the sold out crowds and, and, the, and just the, the reception to it is just a hundred percent positive. So if you're kind of interested in why things are the way they are these days, um, what he did is, um, I want to say a, a few weeks after, uh, Trump took office, he actually went to North Carolina and he went to Pennsylvania, and he went to Michigan, and he went to places that specifically voted for Barack Obama in 2008, and voted, and they voted for Trump in 2016. And he basically went and he asked them why, and his um, and and the information he got, I think, is really eye-opening. So um, it's it's definitely a worthwhile listen. And at that, I will I move have a quick to question. yes. The card says 20 percent off. But do you need the card to get this so the donation goes to the library? If if you forget the card and tell them that you are um, that you would like to have their contribution, they're they're supposed to do it. Okay. And if you and I have a few extra cards if you have any friends and would like an extra card. And I can get more if you want them. So with that, we'll move to the city manager report. Uh, the only thing I have is actually somewhat related to the clean water program. As you know, as you may or may not know, the uh, employees of the clean water program have moved uh, to Campbell, and we now have a vacant space next door. So I have um, trying to look at this as an opportunity, and so I have, you know, as possibly uh, so what are the things that you know the city might be able to you know, entertain as an occupant potentially there, uh, seeing that, you know, in my opinion, the city employees, the city's workforce doesn't really need the space. 
So what I did was, it's just sort of a, a feeler to, as a start, I reached out to the Saratoga Library to, because of course that's where we you know, send our library funds and we have a citizen representative on the board. And uh, the, uh, they actually came over and took a, take a look. And we've just started the conversation and I wanted to uh, just sort of mention to all of you so that you would know that uh, this conversation is taking place. But um, there may be some possibility of working that on, with them on um, you know some use related to a library function uh, for the site. Um, I'm supposed to meet with them again to talk to them a little bit more. But what I would say is that if it seems to be going in some you know real direction, uh, I will definitely be you know coming to the the full council to you know have further discussions with you about it and you know maybe offer up some options. So I'm waiting waiting right now to to um, chat with them again to see if there's any real interest. But per personally and professionally, I think it, you know having something like that could be a real nice community asset um, for us. So I thought it would you know be a good idea, and so we're starting on that down that road possibly. Thank you very much. And with that, we.